Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Secret of Crickley Hall by James Herbert. So as you can see, this is a big old boy. So uh, I'm going to film this in parts, basically uh, every day as I sit down to do my filming, I'm going to read up to the tabs that I have tabbed out, and then I will share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Before that, we have the blurb. So, Dane reads... There is an old empty house in Devil's Cleave, a deep gorge that leads from the high moors down to the harbour village of Hollow Bay. The house is Crickley Hall and it's large and grim, somehow foreboding. It's rumoured to be haunted. It's thought to hold a secret. Despite some reservations, the Calais move in, searching for respite in this beautiful part of North Devon, seeking peace and perhaps to come to terms with what's happened to them as a family. But all is not well with the house. They hear unaccountable noises. A cellar door they shut every night is always open again in the morning. They see things that cannot be real. The house is the last place the Calais should have come to, for the terror that unfolds is beyond belief. Soon they will discover the secret horror of Crickley Hall. The Secret of Crickley Hall is James Herbert's finest novel to date. It explores the darker, more obtuse territories of evil and the supernatural. With brooding menace and rising tension, he masterfully and relentlessly draws the reader through to the ultimate revelation, one that will stay to chill the mind long after the book has been laid aside. So I believe this was turned into a TV series, which I have seen, and I don't remember. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what I make of it. So uh, we get a reference to the Science Museum, which I love going to. It's been a while, I'm about to do another visit, so it goes, uh, In the past, he had liked nothing better than on a Saturday morning, dragging his children, as young as they were, along to South Kensington Science Museum to see the giant steam train engines housed there, climbing up into the cabs with them to explain every wheel and lever it took to get the great machines moving. To his credit, because of his enthusiasm, only Lauren had been bored by the fourth visit. Callie, held in her father's arms, was much too young to be impressed, but Cam went rigid with excitement and awe every time he saw the great iron mammoths. And I talk sometimes, I have this sort of similar thing, I, I find it, I love watching people talk about something that they're passionate about, even if it's something that I personally am not too interested in, because I think their passion kind of comes across in the way they talk, it's kind of contagious. Isn't it Biggie? It's contagious. Yes, the cat is right next to the camera. The son, one of the sons of the, the son of the family, uh, disappeared, and I don't know whether he's dead or alive. Um, and we get Lauren, um, who's one of the girls. Um, we kind of see things through her eyes and how she feels about all this. Then she remembered the main reason for the temporary move. It wasn't just because of Dad's job. He often spent weeks away from home on various engineering assignments. No, this time it was because they had to get Mummy away from their proper house. Lauren's eyes glistened as she thought of Cameron. What a lovely little brother he was. Now he was gone and Mummy still hadn't got over it. It hadn't been her fault. Mummy was tired and couldn't help falling asleep on the park bench. Cam had just wandered off and someone bad had taken him. Lauren tried to imagine who could be that bad. What wicked person would snatch a small boy away and keep him all this time? Why didn't they bring him back or let him go so that the police or someone kind could find him and bring him home to his family? Who could be that dreadful? I hate to break it to you, Lauren, but you're growing up and learning that there are some right old bastards out in the world. And there's a dog, and the dog knows that there's something wrong with uh, Crickley Hall. And we get a barmaid, uh, and she's called Franny as well, which made me laugh because my friend Fran, who works at the art centre, is the barmaid. Um, obviously shares the name. And uh, Eve hasn't been drinking alcohol as well, um, which I relate to because I, I did a year off. I'm just going to read this little this little paragraph. However, the, the other customers return to their conversations and brews, little warmth or further interest coming from them. However, the barmaid, who had short chestnut coloured hair and a dazzling smile, was courteous and friendly as she reeled off the two specials of the day to them from her position behind the bar, and the food, when it arrived, was both tasty and abundant. Even Lauren, who was a picky eater at the best of times and who had grown when the huge plate of sea bass with chips and peas was placed in front of her, finished nearly every last morsel. The sea air and the long walk down to the village were obviously doing wonders for her appetite, Eve thought to herself, pleased by the transition. Gabe relished the local brewery again. He and Vern had sunk several pints of tawny bitter between them on their earlier visit, the hard graft of lifting and unloading stuff back at Crickley Hall engendering a special kind of thirst, while Eve stuck to tonic water. She used to enjoy good wines, but hadn't touched alcohol in almost a year. The girl's orange and lemonade mixed. Lauren's idea of a sophisticated drink, Callie copying her big sister. And here we learn a bit about Gabe, the father. It says, uh, Gabe's fists clench and his teeth bit into his lower lip. He wanted to pound the stone pillar beside him with his fist, but instead he turned away and let his anger subside into bitterness. Let even Lauren pray for their miracle. As for him, he knew miracles never happened. Not in this life they didn't. And this was the only life anyone ever had. I agree with his thinking there. 
but then I'm an atheist. And here's a little bit more about uh, Gabe and his, his thoughts on religion, which again tend to tie pretty closely with my own. He regretted having entered the church. For two months after Cam had disappeared, Gabe had accompanied Eve and their daughters to Sunday Mass, and only because he wanted to support Eve, not because he had suddenly seen the light and thought miracles might just happen if he prayed hard enough. But when nothing had changed, when there was still no trace of Cam after all that time, he had desisted, and Eve would not urge him to go with her anymore, because she understood the bitter anger that was beginning to rage inside him, was aware that for him, attending Mass was doing more harm than good. Oh, it says more harm that good. When he was a juvenile, Gabe had spent time in the Illinois Institute for Delinquent Boys where he had been obliged to attend chapel twice a week, but in those days he had been cool about it. It beat working in the sweltering laundry room or raking dirt on the drill yard. Chapel service meant little to him, but at least it gave him the chance to think for an hour. Thinking time was at a premium on a campus full of wayward, excitable youths. Sure, in those days he was resentful. He figured he had a right to be, but he never blamed God for his circumstances then. Didn't blame him because he didn't believe in him, despite the sermons and the priest's entreaties. And uh, Gabe was involved in a car accident when he was younger, uh, so I'm just going to read this out. The pristine stolen Mercedes saloon in which Gabe and his friends were joyriding went out of control on a bend and crashed into three trees, one after the other. The driver, 17 years old and gang leader, a tough guy who was good in a rumble, went through the windscreen when the car hit the first tree to die instantly as his body slammed into the tree trunk, his bowed head snapping at the neck and smashing his own ribcage, while the passenger in the seat next to him broke his spine at the second tree and had his foot turned back to front on the third impact. Gabe and another gang member, who shared the rear seats with him, were thrown to the floor at the first impact and there they stayed bounced around but safe from serious injury by the backs of the front seats and i just thought this was interesting too um because it, it is kind of unusual um just a nice detail so we get um he wasn't a mama's boy but there was an affinity between them they even shared the same trivial abnormality the little finger of cam's right hand was shorter than the one on his left the same as eve's they also both had fingerprint wells on the fleshy mount of their right palm it was a similarity that they enjoyed for it wasn't an obvious deformity Hand had to be compared to notice it. And then he finds some old toys and we get this. Um, you won't find many of these around anymore, she said, turning the soft doll over in her hand. The reason for searching the attic lost to her for the moment. It's a gollywog. It's just not PC for children to play with anything like this these days. I had one myself when I was very young. And yeah, it's definitely not PC. And also gollywogs are, uh, it became, or a shortened version of that word, which I'm not gonna say, became an insult term for people of color. Um, and then someone calls Lauren a grockle when we get grockle Lauren knew was a derogatory term for tourist or outsider And I think I have that heard that before I just can't for the life of me think of where um, so this Happened to me apparently when I was a kid. I had a I saw a ghost that was a little Victorian girl and this happens to uh, Lily so uh, Lily being the psychic so uh, Lily's parents had often heard her talking to an invisible friend in her room And they questioned their daughter about it in her innocence Lily had told the truth her mother and father, however, assumed the girl wearing old-fashioned clothing was inside Lily's own head, a figment of her lively imagination, and had left it at that, believing she would soon grow out of it. After all, lots of little children had imaginary friends, didn't they? For at least six weeks, the ghost of the Victorian girl continued to appear to Lily, always when she was by herself and in the same upstairs room. They played and giggled together, enjoying each other's company, although Lily sometimes became frustrated because Agnes could never catch a ball or use a skipping rope or pick up a toy. Apart from that, they got along fine. So with me, it was the opposite, where my parents thought it was a ghost, and I think it was an imaginary friend. But hey ho. And uh, we get a reference to Lauren reading her new Philip Pullman as well. So I'm trying to figure out, when was this published? 2006. So that was probably the Amber Spyglass. So uh, the psychic Lily, she says, um, could I have a glass of water? Yes, of course. Are you sure you don't want something stronger? Eve rose to her feet. No, thank you. I had too much wine last night. Besides, I never drink alcohol when I use my psychic sense. For some reason, it interferes with the process. I mean, I can imagine it would do, because you need a clear head, I guess, even though psychicness is a load of bullshit, but you know. And then we hear about, uh, let's see, Mr. Templeton's wife. Percy gave it some thought. Mr. Templeton, he told me his wife felt there was a bad atmosphere about the house and it made her depressed like. She heard the rumours you see about Crickley Hall being haunted and all and maybe she took it too serious. Anyways, twarn't long before she took to her bed. Small things at first, colds, headaches, back aches, them sort of problems. Then they discovered she had cancer. Bad cancer if there's any of the good kind. And then we go, we discover that a character who was presumed dead, either mad or dead, is still alive and they go and visit her. 
and it jumps into her point of view which is really weird at this point in the novel we're over halfway through and it just suddenly introduces like another character's point of view and she's a minor character but anyway uh, we get this little bit of a thought process which I did think was interesting let him off the hook what language was this young man speaking oh yes the nurse had said he was from America Magda decided she didn't like Americans why had it taken them so long to join the war effort against the Germans which was a stupid and needless war anyway she and Augustus liked the Germans they were a fine race of people, strong and adamantine in their beliefs and pursuits. Not like the insidious Jews, the murderers of Christ. And not like the Americans with their impudence and slovenly speech. Not like this impertinent individual before her now. Someone says something teasingly, which just bothers me. I, I hate just this habit of adding L-Y into any word. Uh, so somebody orders a Hennessy, which just made me laugh because we worked an event at the Arts Centre recently where everyone was drinking Hennessy and Cavoisier. We did like... 1200 quid in sales of whatever it is what is it it's not whiskey is it whiskey brandy it's brandy so here we learn what happened to the orphans who were um, sent to Crickley Hall during the war to get away from the, the German bombs and it's pretty bleak so on that first day and despite the long journey the children had made the harsh regime began they were immediately ordered to wash themselves two at a time in the house's one bathroom a water line was marked in the bathtub of three inches rather than the government's water saving limit of five inches the tepid water was only changed twice during the bathing and magda supervised it from a chair on the landing outside the bathroom issuing orders through the open doorway even morris who was considerably bigger and older than the other boys had to share the bath as did susan trainer who at 11 was the eldest girl after the communal bathing it was knit seeking time Magda carried out the searching with a metal comb. Then everybody's hair was cut short, the boys having a pudding basin placed on their heads to set a line for the barber's clippers that Magda used, their hair up to that line so short that the lower scalp and back of the neck was exposed to the air. The boys looked ridiculous, and the girls fared not much better. They had to have short bob cuts that just covered their ears. As well as a toothbrush each and a spare set of underwear, the LCC had provided the orphans with black plimsolls, which they were ordered not to wear inside the house, which would be for most of the time, their only outings being the Sunday morning visit to the local church, so that they would not leave scuff marks on the floors and stairs, nor make undue noise. And um, <laughs> just this great line, basically uh, there's an old man and um, he likes to like self-flagellate and whip himself and stuff but he also gets one of the boys to whip him and it gives him an erection and we get Cribben's erection was enormous, it's engorged globular tip pressed into the bed's thin mattress. What a line, what a line, I can't, I can't not envisage that as well, great. And then we get this little bit where um, Susan, I believe it's Susan, she gets, uh, she gets her first period, yeah it is Susan. So we get, why am I bleeding? Because you're impure, this is a woman's illness, a curse from the Lord to punish them for original sin. But I haven't sinned, miss, I promise. I haven't done anything. Well, you must have. You're far too young for menstruation. She spat the word out as if its mere expression was iniquitous. You're a wicked girl. Augustus finally spoke and his voice was brutal. She must be kept away from the others or her uncleanliness will taint them all. In the corner of the bathroom, Brenda was now crouched and sobbing. Susan had shrunk away from Magda and was cringing against the tiled wall. Please help me, she pleaded, first looking at the woman and then at the man. Magda snatched her wrist. Come with me, we have a place for dirty girls. She pulled Susan to the edge of the bath and, to stop herself falling, the girl stepped out still clutching the reddened towel to her body. Augustus grabbed her by the other arm and Morris quickly stepped aside as brother and sister brought the bowed girl out of the bathroom between them. My clothes, Susan shrieked, dragging her feet. Augustus and his sister merely tightened their grip and pulled her along the landing. You will not need clothes where you're going, child, Magda sneered. The other children had gathered at the bottom of the stairs to the dormitory, none of them daring to venture out onto the landing. Two of the youngest, Stefan and Patience, were clinging to Eugene Smith, both of them crying. Morris would never forget the shame on Susan's face as she was led naked past her friends, and he would never forget the smugness he felt as he trailed behind, even though he was mystified by the girl's condition. Had she cut herself somehow? Would she bleed and bleed until she was dead? And uh, there's someone who um, says, because of his nightmares, he always slept with the ceiling light on, which I have done because of my nightmares. Uh, oh yeah, and then we get the moment where they discover the cribbins, they discover that the Jew that they have, the Jew child who they torment, they discover that he hasn't been circumcised. And so we get this lovely little bit. Cribben calls for help to pin the dark-haired boy down and Morris Stafford eagerly comes forward. He leans his strong upper body on the younger boy's legs so that they are trapped and his hand presses down on the little boy's chest, holding him flat on his back against the table. Augustus slashes with a razor. 
But the cut is too hasty, too imprecise, too deep, and the blood spurts from the little boy's penis. That'll have you crossing your legs with your male or female, that one. Oh yeah, and then, um, what's his name, Pike. Um, he says, at one point he says, At last I heard the sound of his cane thrashing against flesh. I knew that sound. Oh yes, I had come to know it well. Then his spirit would manifest itself. Even in spirit he would raise that cane against me, and I felt its pain as if it were real, even though I'd never physically been struck by it. But I'm sure, slightly earlier, he did get struck by it. Let's have a little look. Yeah, here we go. So Pike says, Magda stood in front of her brother, blocking his way, begging him to stop. When I tried to help her, pulling on his arm, trying to divert him from the classroom, he turned and looked at me as if he was seeing me for the first time. Then he started lashing out at me with his stick. I fell to the floor and curled up there so he couldn't hurt me too much. So you have felt the stick, mate. Anyway, other than that one little inconsistency, overall, The Secret of Crickley Hall, it's a pretty good ghost story. I would say it's like an archetypal haunted house story, um, but with James Herbert's own little twist to it, so that was nice. I actually was finishing it off over Halloween too, so that was pretty good timing. I'll probably give it a four out of five. I think I said in my wrap up, um, it's not necessarily in my top three James Herbert books, but probably my top five. And I'm now looking forward to re-watching the series that was made based on it as well. So yeah, those are my thoughts and feelings on The Secret of Crickley Hall by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.